We've now seen a lot of ways how Schoolbook RSA is causing problems, but of course, normally we don't use Schoolbook RSA. I hope I motivated that clearly enough. So, um, normally RSA is working fine. It's the workhorse of the internet. We see it in many certificates, at least for signatures, uh, very predominantly, sometimes still for encryption systems. But we also sometimes see that it gets broken. Now, what are the main reasons that RSA gets broken? So, what happens when it makes the news, or at least the security encrypted news? Um, some cases are that the prime numbers were just too small. So Texas Instrument was securing the operating systems on some of the calculators with 512-bit RSA moduli. So each of the prime factors had just 256 bits. Now that's nothing you can do in an afternoon, but it's definitely not sufficient. And this was stopping some people from running uh, their operating system or their programs on their calculators. And so they were motivated enough to actually uh, factor those numbers and therefore the TI signing keys are now known. And well, after the first one was done, there was actually a bigger project where multiple people contributed. And so there's now a whole bunch of, of broken RSA 512 keys. Now 512 has been long discontinued. Nobody should be using that anyway. You could also encounter bad randomness. And bad randomness comes in unfortunately way too many flavors. So one is um, known in the Debian RNG paper from 2008 that there were just too few primes. So there was something wrong which reduced it to a very small interval where random numbers were sampled from and then when the num uh, numbers that are sampled from are just from a small 2 to the 32 different numbers, you can figure out how many of those will lead to primes and you could just then brute force for those few primes. And that was pretty bad, but it's well luckily caught now and nothing that bad has been seen after. But something else came up in 2012, namely repeated primes. And the repeated primes, you might have seen this in the exercise sheet uh, that we had last Thursday on exercise sheet 5. Um, there was one where the moduli were not co prime. And so you notice if you're trying to do the Chinese remainder theorem that the GCDs are not one. And well, if the GCD isn't one, you can just um, figure out one common factor from one of those moduli. And that means you get into factorization, therefore you can break it. Now, if you're trying to do that at internet scale, doing pairwise GCDs on a building keys um, would take so too long. So uh, what the following two papers were doing were a smarter version, but it all boils down to, yes, there were keys that shared a prime. And if they share only one prime, so if they're not, if you have both primes being identical, well, then these two users can read each other's messages, but nobody else can break them. But if two keys overlap on one prime, then the second key basically breaks the first one. So this one was fine alone, this one was fine alone, but because they overlap, suddenly both of them are broken. And then one research that I was been involved with was breaking the Taiwanese uh, citizen cards for a small number of those where another issue with a broken random number generator led the random number generator kind of being stuck and leading to very strange patterns. So we saw primes where there was a, a bit pattern of 110110, and that means that whatever went into generating this prime was definitely not random. Also, people try to sometimes to be smart and uh, kind of force things to be prime, and that led to primes being chosen in, well, you kind of knew what residue classes they came from, and well, with a lot more math than we can cover in this lecture, um, these were breakable by that. So whenever you have a restriction on your primes, be it by not having enough randomness or by manually reducing where you get them from, you're opening the doors to attacks. But there are enough primes. It is really incomprehensible why two people could possibly have the same prime if everything goes wrong. So. Of course, when you're trying to pick a prime randomly, you go like, well, that's not a prime, that's not a prime. And people tell you that, yeah, primes are thinning out if they get larger. If you look at small numbers, like up to 10, you're seeing 2, 3, 5, and 7 being prime. And if you go up to 100, there's a much, much smaller density. And unsurprisingly, because, well, you know that all the small primes pile up and I mean multiply. And so you're getting the larger numbers having all these small prime factors. But the prime number theorem says that if you're looking for primes up to some number n, then they're n divided by the natural logarithm of n many primes. 
and that is actually quite a few so let's look at well you should have been generating RSA with keys with 4000 bits so that each of the primes has 2048 bits so let's look at how many primes there are which have exactly 248 bits so that's on the scale of 10 to the 600 I'm taking here the 2048 bit primes and I'm subtracting all the primes that just have one bit less and we're only 10 to the 9 people so even if you generate multiple RSA keys for all the different devices if you have a new RSA key every day or every hour you're not going to reach 10 to the 613 so it is not by chance that those um, RSA keys that were found on the internet to have common factors that those were overlapping it's not that there are too few numbers so there is no chance it's a very very low chance that two people randomly get the same key or randomly get an overlapping prime so that only happens if something is wrong with the random number generators or if people are using some factory settings so there were actually some keys found which were still the original key that came from the manufacturer which was the same for every single box that was manufactured the same way well don't do that now why do developers go into effort um, to find these primes let's look at the same formula again the, the prime number theorem formula this also implies that if we want to have a number being prime then the chance of actually finding it goes down the chance that a number is prime if it's the size of n is 1 over the log of n so if you're looking for 5 12 bit primes which you shouldn't have shouldn't do i mean that's rsa 1024 you probably just need 350 trials and if you double the bit size you're roughly doubling the number of trials because well the bit size in the exponent and if you take the log of that then the exponent times two gets just a factor of two there and so if you're generating your 4000 bit rsa key your computer has to do about 1500 trials to find the first prime and then again for the second prime and each of those trials does require a primality test so it does actually require some work and so the rogue attack that i mentioned two slides ago actually happened because some developer tried to be kind of smart tried to say hey look well we shouldn't test an even number and i fully agree we shouldn't test an even number well we shouldn't test numbers that are divisible by three totally correct so that developer was taking a whole bunch of small primes and saying we shouldn't test any primes that have any of those factors well any numbers that have any of those factors because they can't be prime and that is absolutely correct however uh, what happened then was that this uh, developer ended up with doing some other tricks which also taken alone would probably have been okay but the combination of those led to far fewer primes and kind of structured primes which were findable so what you should be doing if you ever need to generate primes just sample numbers randomly and see that they're prime so no smart tricks your computer can handle doing 3000 trials to find your uh, two factors for the 4096 bit key okay now how else did rsa get broken so the normal thing that we actually hope that happens is that somebody has to put a lot of effort into actually factoring the number in. know that there is no guarantee that breaking RSA implies factoring, but for well chosen moduli, for everything else going fine, we don't know any other attack. So basically, in order to break some large RSA factor, uh, RSA number, you have to factor it. Now, to find small factors, you know everything, you know how to do trial factorization, you check, okay, is the last digit is it even, or in binary representation is the last bit zero. And then you can do similar tricks for divisibility by three and five and so on. So for small factors, you just do trial division. For some intermediate factors, uh, we're going to see a method on the next slide, which is called the p minus one method. And then if you stay on for doing your masters here, we're going to see two more methods. Uh, one is the elliptic curve method of factorization, which is a generalization of the p minus one method. And there's also a method due to Pollard, which is called the row method. So these are very good methods for medium-sized primes. And medium-sized primes are like 
40 bits prime. So that's that's a reasonably large number, but you wouldn't want to do trials like this actually. Now for RSA numbers, that definitely goes beyond what you can cover here, but the method of choice is the number filter. So what this does on a, on a high level is it takes this hard to factor n, your RSA modulus, and turns this one hard to factor number into many, 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 many other factorizations. Now these are more like garden variety numbers, so there's nothing special about these numbers, and so you can then factor those pretty easily, but you need to factor a whole lot of them. Now, the way that this factoring is working for these small numbers, well, you could try to do child division, and that would be fine, but um, because you have a whole bunch of numbers to check, there's a method called sieving, which is also where the sieve comes from in the name of the number field sieve, which you can think of the, the sieve of Eratosthenes. So Eratosthenes um, has this method where you take all the integers and then you cross out multiples of two. The next number you find, well, that is not crossed out is three, so three is prime, and then you cross out all the multiples of three. So similar to this, crossing out all the multiples of two, then crossing out all the multiples of three, that is how the sieves work here. So you do your trial division in batch on all numbers, on a whole range of numbers. And then once you've dealt with the small factors, then you go to the methods that I just mentioned to factor out some medium-sized factors. <laughs> and basically, everything which hasn't been factored by then is not a nice to factor number, and we can just discard it. There, there are some subtleties more that I'm brushing under the carpet, but we basically need sieving and then some medium-sized factors and everything else. Many of these trial factorizations or many of these um, easy to factor numbers will also not be completely factored because they're not nice enough. And once you have done enough of those, once you find enough of these that actually factor, then you have a big step of linear algebra. Now this whole package um, has a complexity which is, which is sub-exponential. So what does it mean in practice? So if you if you want to make the work twice as hard for the attacker, then it's not enough to just double your key length. So it's not enough to go from 1024 bits to 2048 bits for your for your primes. That doesn't quite double the hardness for the attacker. So exponential complexity would mean double at that case. Sub-exponential means, well, you need more than doubling the length in order to make it twice as hard. But still, it's not a problem to adjust the parameters with 4096 bits. You're way beyond 1020, uh, beyond 128 bits of security. And so until quantum computers come, we do believe that that's an okay key size. So if you have chosen an RSA key with that many bits, you should be fine. If you've chosen the 1024 bit, you should probably upgrade your keys. Yes, I still have a 1024 bit key that you can find on the internet, but I don't recommend using it. Now, the P-1 method. We're covering this here because you know all the mathematics behind it. So you know Fermat's little theorem, which means that if you take any A that is co-prime to P and you compute A to the P-1, then you're getting 1. Or you might have seen this on previous slides as A to the P is congruent to A modulo P. But if A is co-prime to P, you can divide both sides by A, and therefore you get the formula that is just stated on the slide. That also means that if p is a factor of n, then p is a divisor of this, this big GCD there. Let's take the slope. So, well, p is a factor of n, that means it divides the second part of the GCD. And we have just seen that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. Now we bring the 1 over to the other side, so we're getting a to the p minus 1 minus 1 over here, and that is congruent to 0. Now, being congruent to zero means that p is a divisor of this. So p divides the first part and p divides the second part. And the GCD means it's the greatest common divisor. Well, it's definitely a common divisor of both. So it is included in whatever the result of this GCD computation is. Now, if p is sufficiently large, say if n is an RSA modulus, you can be pretty sure that there is no other factor in there, so that p equals the GCD. But if this n is some more normal number, then 
the only thing that P will do is split N. So there will be one part of N that includes P, which is what's in the GCD, and then some other part of N, which doesn't include P. But at least you've made your problem smaller. And then you continue doing that until you actually have found the prime factors of N. So how to do this in practice? I mean, <laughs> you don't know P. I mean, you want a factor N, so you can't compute A to the P minus one. So what we're doing is we're picking some random S or actually some very structured S where S has many small prime factors. And then we just do this computation and we're basically uh, betting that S is divisible by P minus one. You don't actually need the divisibility by P minus one. It's enough if the order of A modulo P divides S, but if S is divisible by P minus one, then P definitely divides this GCD. Now let's look at some example numbers. So if you're picking a very, very nice S, which has lots of small factors, namely it's the least common multiple of the numbers up to 20. Okay, so up to 20, that means we're having a 16 in there. That means we have divisible by two to the four. We have a nine in there, so that's Greek squared. And then we have the primes five, seven, 11, 13, 17, and 19. And so all of those numbers, if the P minus one has any of these factors, or is composed of these factors, then it will be findable with the GCD. So let's look at what numbers divide this two to the special S that we're looking at here. So of all the primes of less than a thousand, there are 168 of those, 70, so slightly less than half of them, are divisors of this number. So if you're taking this S and then some N, then you're finding any of these 70 primes just by the one GCD computation. And then if you allow one to do more, if you're going for 10,000 num uh, uh, <laughs> numbers up to 10,000, then you're finding 156. And you see it, it gets thinner, so it's not doubling each time, but it's, it keeps it up for quite a while. So um, this has a pretty high chance of finding the small and medium-sized primes. And so if you want to factor, uh, find numbers up to 10 to the 6, so that means, well, 10 is about 2 to the 3, so 2 to the 18, then you're already having a good chance of finding it with one of those. Now in practice, you would be um, computing this number in a special way, namely you would be picking some S with small factors, so some LCM or some factorial of a number, and then compute this A to the S. And you wouldn't compute this gigantic number only to then do a GCD computation. What you do is you compute the S, A to the S, already modulo N. Because if you look at this computation here, there is a GCD of A to the S minus one with N. And when you look at the, how the GCD computation works, what you do first is you take the larger one and reduce it modulo the smaller one. So the first step would be taking the A to the S minus one and compute this mod N. So what we're doing here, computing a to the s modulo n with fast exponentiation, that mod n means actually we're keeping our numbers small. And okay, afterwards we have to not forget to also subtract one from this, um, and then you can compute the GCD. If this fails, so if we don't find any split if the GCD is one, then we can, for instance, increase s. So maybe we're missing some primes, or we pick a different A. Maybe this A didn't have a good order. Little, uh, the master little theorem does say that we have to test that A and P are co-primes. So we could also compute the a, GCD of A and N at the beginning, but if N was so easy to factor, then you should have actually uh, done some more on the trial division before you get to the P minus one method. So we can typically skip this GCD computation because it's unlikely to do anything. And so if you're doing this in practice, so if you would be doing a real P minus one method computation, then you would see a second phase. So if after this lecture, you're feeling motivated to look at the academic literature on the P minus one method, you're talking about the first and the second phase of the P minus one method, where everything I've told you so far is the first phase. And then in the second phase, you would be doing um, individual large primes with a different data flow from what you're seeing here. 
but the idea is the same. The idea is again that if the order of a mod p divides the exponent, then this p will also divide the GCD. All right, so that's uh, all I wanted to tell you about how to factor numbers. Um, you should keep in mind that RSA numbers are typically chosen large enough that factorization doesn't work. The TI example is, is the famous uh, counter case for that. At this moment, um, academics have factored 768-bit numbers. So those are now publicly known to be factored. 512-bit numbers you could do with a bit of cluster time. So that's really um, not a good challenge. But nobody has publicly factored a 1024-bit number. We do believe that the NSA is able to do that. So it's not a secure method. So don't choose um, RSA with 1024-bit keys but nobody has actually done this publicly yet.